It's time to begin the best of the rest for Nintendo Power 7th year, and with the change in format to focusing on games with from the uh, now playing column that wasn't featured, the list of the games we're covering is a lot longer, going to about 41 games, so we're splitting this into about four parts, covering two to three issues per episode. This time, we are covering issues uh, 61 and 62. Of the these games, there are two additional ones which were covered in now playing but were unreleased. Socks the Cat Walks the Hill, and Freeway Flyboys. The latter game was an adaptation of a Japanese title that has not yet had a translation dumped, and generally when I do import games, I try to go for ones that have a translation available, unless the game is something like a brawler where translations are utterly unnecessary. And so I haven't found any first translation ROMs for that as yet. I may cover that again later in the future. Socks the Cat was cancelled before it was released. There's a ROM dump out there, but I don't know how complete it is. Um, in terms of, is it at ready to ship stage, or if it's at, like, barely playable stage? So, I'm holding off on that one as well. Though, so there's plenty of enough ground to cover, so let's get started. Uh, one other thing, normally instead of these episodes come out monthly, I'm going to try to get these out a little more quickly, given the circumstances. And because it's all video games, we can, like, no talking about an issue of the magazine, this actually makes it a little faster for them to put out, I just gotta get through playing the games. But we'll see how this goes. Again, let's begin. Eye the Beholder is a dungeon crawler in the same vein as Dungeon Master. It's played in the first person with semi-real-time gameplay, as opposed to slipping into a turn-based mode like Arcana. Also, unlike Arcana, the game lacks any form of auto-map, which means if you're going to play this, you're going to want to either map the game dungeon levels online and put those in another window or web browser or on your phone and tablet while you play, or, you know, get some graph paper. Additionally, the interface is a little rough with the controller, though I was able to adjust with some speed. Um, the game does support the Super Nintendo mouse, which is probably the best way to play if you're not playing on PC. Um, and honestly, that's probably the best way to play it. There are third-party programs that will hook into the game that will provide a certain degree of auto-mapping and other quality-of-life features which the Super Nintendo version lacks. But it's still a decent port for the time. Next is Fire Striker. This game, how do I describe it? Well, you take Arkanoid, you turn the pilot into a wizard, and then in addition to power-ups, you put some enemies in there with the bricks. Now you add a fighter, who can run around the top of the screen along with the wizard, um, and the fighter can move around in three dimensions, um, in forward, backward, left, or right, like basically eight directions, whereas the wizard can only move left and right. Um, and the wizard and the fighter can basically hit the ball whatever direction he mo he's moved last, and then you just basically your goal is to hit your magic ball through the bricks at the top of the screen so you can progress. It's a fascinating game. My one complaint is that this is a game which definitely works a lot better with co-op than with single player. On uh, two player, tracking both characters can get cumbersome um, at times, particularly with how the game handles camera positioning and that sort of thing. But otherwise the game works all right. Now, Super Godzilla has an interesting concept on paper. Doing a Godzilla game is a more deliberate strategy game instead of a fighting game. It makes sense. Kaiju movements are more slow and deliberate than the faster action of a fighting game, so it'd be natural to slow things down a little bit. Except this game decides to put the strategy elements in real time, and then the actual Kaiju fights have some really bizarre random mechanics to them, where you have to launch your attack when the enemy's biorhythms are low, then when their biorhythms are high, then they'll land a launch a special attack, except they have no tells, aside from the biorhythm gauge, constantly moving biorhythm gauge, um, to let you know what kind of attack you're going to launch and how big it's going to be, and there's no way to defend against those attacks, there's no block button or anything like that, it's just, you have to move far enough away, except you're, you're Godzilla, so you're, you're going to be in melee large portions of the time, and yeah, this game is terrible. I... There's a place for a strategic, deliberate strategy game around kaiju fights. This game isn't it. 
Eek the Cat is a platformer game that starts out with an escort mission that, from all I can tell, has some unique control against these interests coming right out of the gate. Either that, or this game is going to be all escort missions out of the first one, in which case this game should be avoided at all cost. If not, then still, starting your game with an escort mission is putting your worst foot forward. Monster Max for the Game Boy, the first of the two Game Boy games we're covering this time, introduces another one of the things that I hate more than anything else from this era and the, and the last one, the 8-bit era of gaming, the isometric platformer. This type of game is barely playable. I this, this type of game, it's, it's barely playable on the, game, on the NES, and then this game in particular is barely playable on the significantly larger screen of a Game Boy emulator. Never mind, you know, on the actual normal LCD monochrome Game Boy screen. Screen. I can't even imagine how hard this game would be to play in that form. Now, WCW Wrestling, the main event, our other Game Boy title, is in a lot of ways the standard NES wrestling game, just shifted over to Game Boy. And unfortunately, there are some corners cut with this game due to the limitations of the platform that makes it not work quite as well as it would on the NES. Music is limited, there's barely any crowd noise, and the controls are pretty basic. Even more so than the WWF Raw games for uh, the Super Nintendo, which are effectively two-button games anyway. That said, the game does get the looks of characters right. Dustin Rhodes here does look like the real person, e even his sprite on the screen. Um, I'll admit, though, that I did not try playing with, um, at this point, stunning Steve Austin. Um, so I can't tell how he looks in comparison because stun both Stunning and Stunning Steve Austin and Dustin Rhodes are bald, kind of pasty-faced white guys. So those are two character designs which might have difficulty translating over from, you know, to the Game Boy. Dustin's a little, has a little more, little more um, body mass, let's just say at this time in his career, and even now, uh, getting to the sort of gold dust level physique, whereas Steve Austin has a bit more a bit more tone to him. Our final game of this episode is Operation Europe Path to Victory, uh, another Koei strategy game, the second of their two World War II games. Now, this title, like many other Koei strategy games, is one where you need a manual to really succeed. The game doesn't communicate a lot of information within itself in terms of combat effectiveness of different unit types against each other, general weapon stats, that sort of thing. Some of this information is buried in menus, others would probably be in the manual if I had it, but I don't. Which makes things tricky when it comes to trying to succeed at the game's various scenarios. You don't really aren't able to, to properly plan out your actions because the question becomes, okay, having to dig through like six different menus to find out, okay, this is what these units are, so I can better deploy them, and here's what types of subunits are within those units, so I can also position those troops in the right areas. That sort of thing. And on top of all of that, this game's a slow burn, both in the sense of how long it can take to get started in some fights, and in the sense that it can take a while before you realize you're, rev you're irrevocably hosed. It took me like 30 minutes to get to my first actual battle before I realized, oh, I'm actually managed to out outmatch myself here in terms of the type of artillery I'm facing. It makes the game hard to recommend, even for seasoned strategy veterans. Shorter-ish selection of games this time, but that's okay. Again, I'm trying to get through these episodes more a little more quickly, so I can get through the best of the rest more quickly. I'll be going through each batch and giving up a pick out of each chunk as for, for these. So, for this one, for the rest, I'm kind of on a dead split between Eye of the Beholder and Fire Striker. On the one hand, yes, Eye of the Beholder, there is the GOG version available, and there are trainer tools and assistance and that sort of thing that will provide a, the auto map which the game lacks. And... Honestly, the game is also, in multiple respects, a little more playable with the mouse. That said, it works. The game plays fairly well. It is a decent port of, of the NES game. It's certainly, it's not the perfect, the best way to play it, but it, it's very playable. Also, on the other hand, we've got, got Fire Striker, which 
I really like how it gives a very novel and interesting spin, no pun intended, on the concept of um, games like Arkanoid, with enemies on the screen, with having two different characters you move around the screen at any one time. I'm actually be kind of interested in seeing if this were to get were to get a remake at some point, because I think interesting stuff could come out of this. I'm not sure who owns the rights though. The game was developed by DMC, this, um, which is Rockstar, um, but maybe it's owned by the publisher. I don't know. It's fun. I enjoyed it a great deal. I'm probably going to hunt down a copy of that at some point for a physical copy. Next time, we continue through the list. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.